Whistler by W. W. Jacobs. <clears throat> it wanted a few nights to Christmas, a festival for which the small market town of Chorchester was making extensive preparations. The narrow streets, which had been thronged with people, were now almost deserted. The cheap Jack from London, with the remnant of breath left him after his evening's exertions, was making feeble attempts to blow out his naphtha lamp, and the last shops open were rapidly closing for the night. In the comfortable coffee room of the old boar's head, half a dozen guests, principally commercial travelers, sat talking by the light of the fire. The talk had drifted from trade to politics, from politics to religion, and so, by easy stages, to the supernatural. Three ghost stories, never known to fail before, had fallen flat. There was too much noise outside, too much light within. The fourth story was told by an old man, or an old hand, with more success. The streets were quiet, and he had turned the gas out. In the flickering of light of the fire, as it shone on the glasses and danced with the shadows on the walls, the story proved so enthralling that George, the waiter, whose presence had been forgotten, created a very disagreeable sensation by suddenly starting up from the dark, a dark corner and gliding silently from the room. "'That's what I call a good story,' said one of the men, sipping his hot whiskey. Of course, it's an old idea that spirits like to get into the company of human beings. A man told me once that he traveled down the Great Western with a ghost and hadn't the slightest suspicion of it until the inspector came for tickets. My friend said the way that that, the, that ghost tried to keep up appearances by feeling for it in all its pockets looking for, on the floor was quite touching. Ultimately, it gave up and with a faint groan vanished fr through the ven ventilator. That'll do, Hurst, said another man. It's not a subject for jesting, said the little old gentleman who had been an attentive listener. I've never seen an apparition myself, but I know people who have, and I consider that they form a very interesting link between us and the afterlife. There's a ghost story connected with this house, you know. Never heard of it, said another speaker, and I've been here some years now. It dates back <clears throat> a long time now, said the old gentleman. You heard about Jerry Bundler, George. Well, I've heard odds and ends, sir, said the old waiter, but I never put much count to him. There was one chap here what said he saw it, and the governor sacked him prompt. My father was a native of this town, said the old gentleman, and knew the story well. He was a truthful man and a steady churchgoer, but I've heard him declare that once in his life saw the appearance of Jerry Bundler in this house. And who was this bundler, inquired a voice. A London thief, pickpocket, highwayman of anything he could turn his dishonest hand to, replied the old gentleman. And he was run to the earth in this house one Christmas week, some eighty years ago. He took his last supper in this very room, and after he had gone up to bed, a couple of Bow Street runners, who had followed him from London, but lost the son a bit, went upstairs with the landlord and tried the door. It was stout oak and fast, so one went into the yard, and by means of a short ladder got on to the window sill, while the other stayed outside the door. Those below in the yard saw the man crouching on the sill, and there, then there was a sudden smash of glass, and with a cry he fell in a heap on the stones at their feet. Then in the moonlight they saw the white face of the pickpocket peeping over the sill, and while some stayed in the yard, others ran into the house and helped the other man to break the door in. It was difficult to obtain an entrance even then, for it was barred with heavy furniture. But they got in at last, and the first thing that met their eyes was the body of Jerry dangling from the top of the bed by his own handkerchief. Which bedroom was it? asked two or three voices together. The narrator shook his head. That I can't tell you. But the story goes that Jerry still haunts this house, and my father used to declare positively that the last time he slept here, the ghost of Jerry Bundler lowered itself from the top of his bed and tried to strangle him. That'll do, said an uneasy voice. I wish you thought to ask your father which bedroom it was. What for? inquired the old gentleman. Well, I should take care not to sleep in it, that's all, said the voice shortly. There's nothing to fear, said the other. I don't believe for a moment that ghosts could really hurt one. 
In fact, my father used to confess that it was only the unpleasantness of the thing that upset him, and that for all practical purposes, Jerry's fingers might have been made of cotton wool for all the harm they could do. That's all very fine, said the last speaker again. A ghost story is a ghost story, sir, but when a gentleman tells a, a tale of a ghost in the house in which one is going to sleep, I call it, moment, I call it most ungentlemanly. Pooh, nonsense, said the old gentleman, rising. Ghosts can't hurt you. For my own part, I should rather like to see one. Good night, gentlemen. Good night, said the others. And I only hope Jerry will pay, pay you a visit, added the nervous man as the door closed. Bring some more whiskey, George, said a stout commercial. I want keeping up with when the talk turns this way. Shall I light the gas, Mr. Malcolm, said George. No, the fire is very comfortable, said the traveler. Now, gentlemen, any of you know any more? I think we've had enough, said the other man. We shall be thinking we see spirits next, and we're not all like the old gentleman who has just gone. Old humbug, said Hurst. I should like to put him to the test. Suppose I dress up as Jerry Bundler and go and give him a chance of displaying his courage. Bravo, said Malcolm huskily, drowning one or two faint no's. Just for the joke, gentlemen. No, no, drop it, Hurst, said another man. Only for the joke, said Hurst somewhat eagerly. I've got some things upstairs in which I'm going to play in the rival's knee. Breeches, buckles, and all of that sort of thing. It's a rare chance. If, you, if you'll wait a bit, I'll give you a full dress rehearsal, entitled Jerry Bundler, or The Nocturnal Strangler. You won't frighten us, said the commercial, with a husky laugh. I don't know that, said Sharp, Hurst sharply. It's a question of acting, that's all. I'm pretty good, ain't I, Summers? Oh, you're all right for an amateur, said his friend, with a laugh. I'll bet a level sob you don't frighten me, said the stout traveler. Done, said Hurst. I'll take the bet to frighten you first and the old gentleman afterwards. These gentlemen shall be the judges. You won't frighten us, sir, said another man, because we're prepared for you. But you better leave the old man alone. It's dangerous play. Well, I'll try you first, said Hurst, springing up. No guess, mind. He ran lightly upstairs to his room, leaving the others, most of whom who had been drinking somewhat freely, to wrangle about his proceedings. It ended in two of them going to bed. He's acting. He's crazy on acting, said Summers, lighting his pipe. Thinks he's the equal of almost any, anybody, almost. It doesn't matter with us, but I won't let him go to the old man. And he won't mind so long as he gets the opportunity of acting to us. Well, I hope he'll hurry up, said Malcolm Yawning. It's nearly twelve now. Nearly half an hour passed. Malcolm drew his watch from his pocket and was busy winding it. When George, the waiter, who had been sent on an errand to the bar, burst suddenly into the room and rushed towards them. He's coming, gentlemen, he said breathlessly. Why, you're frightened, George, said the stout commercial with a chuckle. It was the suddenness of it, said George sheepishly. And besides, I didn't look for seeing him in the bar. There's only a glimmer of light there. And he was sitting on the floor behind the bar. I nearly trod on him. Oh, you'll never make a man, George, said Malcolm. Well, it took me unawares, said the waiter. Not, not that I've, I'd have gone down to the bar by myself if I'd known he was there. But, and I don't believe you would either, sir. Nonsense, said Malcolm. I'll go and fetch him in. You don't know what it's like, sir, said George, catching him by the sleeve. It ain't fit to look at by yourself. It ain't, indeed. It's got the... what's that? They all started at the sound of a smothered cry from the staircase and the sound of somebody running hurriedly along the passage. Before anybody could speak, the door flew open and a figure bursting into the room flung itself gasping and shivering upon them. What is it? What's the matter? demanded Malcolm. Why, it's Hurst. He shook him roughly and then held some spirit to his lips. Hurst drank it greedily, with a sharp intake of his breath, gripped him by the arm. Like the gas, George, said Malcolm. The waiter obeyed hastily. Hurst, a ludicrous but pitiable figure in knee breeches and coat, a large wig all awry, and his face a mess of grease paint, 
clung to him trembling. Now, what's the matter? asked Malcolm. I've seen it, said Hurst with a hysterical sob. Oh, Lord, I will never play the fool again. Never. Seen what? The ghost, anything, said Hurst wildly. Rot, said Malcolm uneasily. I was coming down the stairs, said Hurst, just capering down as I thought I, if I ought to do. I felt a tap. He broke off suddenly and peered nervously through the door, open door into the passage. I thought I saw it again, he whispered. Look at the foot of the stairs. Can you see anything? No, there's nothing there, said Malcolm, whose own voice shook a little. Go on. You felt a tap on your shoulder. I turned round and saw a little wicked head and a white dead face. Pa! That's what I saw in the bar, said George. Or it was devilish. Hurst shuddered, and still retaining his nervous grip of Malcolm's sleeve, dropped into a chair. It's the most unaccountable thing, said the dumbfounded Malcolm, turning to the others. It's the last time I come to this house. I leave tomorrow, said George. I wouldn't go down to that bar again by myself. No, not for fifty pounds. It's talking about the thing that caused it, I expect, said one of the men. We've all been talking about this and having it in our minds. Practically, we've been forming a spiritualistic circle without knowing it. Hey, the old gentleman said the Malcolm heartily. Upon my soul, I'm half afraid to go to bed. It's odd that it's odd they should both think they saw something. I saw a plain as I see you, sir, said George solemnly. Perhaps if you keep your eyes turned up the passage, you'll see it for yourself. They followed the direction of his finger, but saw nothing. Although one of them fancied that a head peeped round the corner of the wall. Who will come down to the bar? said Malcolm, looking round. You can go if you like, said one of the others, with a faint laugh. We'll wait here for you. The stout traveler walked towards the door and took a few steps up the passage. Then he stopped. All was quite silent, and he walked slowly to the end and looked down fearfully towards the glass partition which shut off the bar. Three times he made as though to go for to it. Then he turned back and glanced over his shoulder came hurriedly back to the room. Did you see it, sir? whispered George. Don't know, said Malcolm softly. I fancied I saw something, but it might have been fancy. I'm in the mood to see anything just now. How are you feeling, sir? Oh, I feel a bit better now, said Hurst, somewhat briskly, as all eyes were turned upon him. I dare say you think I'm easily scared, but you didn't see it. Not at all, said Malcolm, smiling faintly despite himself. I'm going to bed, said Hurst, noticing the smile and resenting it. Will you share my room with me, Summers? I will with pleasure, said his friend, provided you don't mind sleeping with the gas on full all night. He rose from his seat and, bidding the company a friendly good night, left the room with his crestfallen friend. The others saw them at the foot of the stairs and, having heard the, their door close, returned to the coffee room. Well, I suppose the bet's off, said the stout commercial, poking the fire and then standing with his legs apart on the hearth rug. Though, as far as I can see, I won it. I never saw a man so scared in all my life. Sort of poetic justice about it, isn't there? Never mind the poet poetry or justice, said one of the lis his listeners. Who's going to sleep with me? I will, said Malcolm affably. And I suppose we will share a room together, Mr. Leake, said the third man, turning to the fourth. No, thank you, said the other briskly. I don't believe in ghosts. If anything comes into my room, I shall shoot it. That won't hurt a spirit, Leek, said Malcolm decisively. Well, the noise will be like company to me, said Leek, and it'll wake the house too. But if you're nervous, sir, he added with a grin to the man who suggested sharing his room, George will be too, only too pleased to sleep on the doormat inside your room, I know. That I will, sir, said George fervently, and if you're, you gentlemen would only come down with me to the bar to pull the gas out. I could never be sufficient, be sufficiently grateful. All right, watch part two of the video in order to finish the story.